What's up ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at two anime series, reviewing them, and comparing them. In the blue corner we have Space Battleship Yamoto from 1974, and in the red corner we have its remake Space Battleship Yamoto 2199 from 2012. Now this video was originally intended just to be a review of the remake alone, but as I was watching it I couldn't help but overcome the feeling that there was more to the series that I was wasn't seeing by watching the remake alone. I couldn't help but notice that the anime had a bit of that old 70s flair and instead of just being a total clean slate revamp, I felt the urge to just do a bit of extra space exploration and watch the original series just to see how well of a remake 2199 actually is and I'm glad that I did. Before I get started into this comparison slash review of these two shows, I first wanted to say thanks to all of the loyal Patreon supporters who voted for this anime to be reviewed. It took a bit longer than expected because I ended up watching two anime series instead of just one, but I think that would just be the best way to do the video. But first, before tonight's main event, a bit of background about its original creator Leiji Matsumoto, the godfather of drunken space-traveling doctors. Leiji began in 1953 but didn't receive recognition until 1971 with the manga series Otoko Oiden, which follows a struggling college student. Leiji moved on to make an episodic World War II manga, which ultimately became the Cockpit OVA, which I do recommend for anybody looking for a traditional war anime as it is set within World War II because, hey, I mean, looking for realistic war anime is sadly like trying to find manga created by Tite Kubo that aren't bleach. Oh, there's one. Although Matsumoto's dabbled in many different genres, it seems to me that science fiction is his favorite genre considering that he's been working on science fiction manga for much longer than really anything else, even in 1968 when he created Sexaroid. Yeah, he did other manga too, but I just wanted a good excuse to say Sexaroid. By the way, how odd was it that Smut from the 1960s was actually kinda classy and when you compare this to the average anime Smut nowadays, I mean it seems like as anime got older the girls got younger and now we have stuff like No Game No Life. Hell, 10 years from now we're probably gonna have Rugrats. Eventually, Matsumoto's interest and experience in creating science fiction stories came to a head as he was invited to direct a new anime series by the name of Asteroid Ship Icarus created by Yoshinobu Nishizaki, which was basically Lord of the Flies in space where teenagers fly a hollow asteroid through the solar system in search of planet Iskandar. The story was originally going to feature lots of internal conflicts due to the fact that the teenagers have varying opinions and also their self-interest as well. Ultimately, Matsumoto would make dramatic changes to this concept and change it into what we know today as Space Battleship Yamoto. Matsumoto is a legend and the catalog of anime and manga under his belt is so vast that there's really no point in going into everything that he's done, but I can say that some of the most noteworthy titles that you may know him for, with the exception of Yamato, are Captain Harlock and Galaxy Express 999, which are two anime that I recommend if you're looking to understand the history of anime. They're by no means my favorites within their respective eras, but they are steeped in history due to its creator having at least 20 years of manga experience under his belt before creating them. Now that I've given a brief history on Matsumoto, let's get down to tonight's main event. Due to the fact that both of these anime are so close to each other, I'll begin with a story that they both share before getting into what sets them apart and my comparisons of the shows. The story is set in the year 2199, where Earth is ravaged by radioactive meteorites used as projectiles from the Gamillas, an alien race who live on a distant planet. At this point, humans live in underground just to avoid avoid radiation, but this is just a temporary solution. One day they discover alien blueprints for a wave motion engine and a message from Queen Starsha who claims she has a device which can clean Earth's atmosphere from all of its radiation. The only catch is they need to use the wave motion device after they build it, travel all the way across the solar system and basically fight against all these aliens and get it, then come back. I suppose one could ask why 
why they didn't just send one device instead of the other, but then we wouldn't have much of a story. Both stories follow a small cast of main characters and a large cast of side characters with varying degrees of detail. Captain Okita, a salted dog of the Earth Defense Force who guides his crew through the stars, Kodai, an orphan who lost his only brother in war, and Yuki, who's just a woman who likes Kodai. The conflict of both anime arise from internal and external sources. For one, many of these characters have scars from previous tragedies in their lives. For example, Kodai having lost his family, and Okita having witnessed many of his men die in combat under his command. Additionally, there's a bit of infighting with the crew as people have their own agendas in space. These particular conflicts vary with each anime, but it still exists nonetheless. I feel like this is one of the remnants of the original story that Matsumoto left intact. Of course, there's also the Gamillions as well who confront the Yamato around every turn. And to make things more interesting, the Gamillions themselves also suffer from the same infighting almost in the same way that the Yamato does. Now moving on to some of the pros, cons, and differences between the two anime. Starting off with the characters and how their stories are handled. The original did a good job of characterization for both Okita and Kodai considering that they were both the main characters and the remake, on the other hand, manages to focus on almost all of the characters equally while adding new characters to tell the same story. I can't really say that one is better or worse than the other because it just depends on your preferences. Either you prefer a story to mostly focus on a few main characters or all of its characters equally. A good example of how both of these versions present the same story but in different ways is with Kodai. In the beginning of both anime, after the first significant battle with the Chameleons, the crew takes a break to have a short party and also video chats with their families back home. As all of the crew lined up to take their turns chatting with their loved ones, Kodai is basically one of the last people there. In the original anime, this is a very emotional moment here where Kodai is told to go in, but he sits there looking at the black screen because he's got nobody to talk to. All of his family was killed in war, and Yuki comes in to see that he has no one to talk to, and it was actually a very sad moment to see that. Now, that was actually one of the more memorable moments from the original anime for me, or at least the most memorable moment that wasn't some sort of wacky uh, bit of comedy because there's actually a lot of that within the original show but I really felt uh, for his character at that point and the remake however totally skips all of that scene in order for Kodai to meet a new character Yamamoto and to bond with her. Here Kodai asks if she will be calling her family and she explains her situation and how all of her family was killed in war and Kodai basically says yeah, me too. Now, when comparing these two scenes directly, it's easy to see that the original was able to capture more emotion with their version, but the remake manages to do a bit more in terms of the story in exchange for this incredibly touching moment here. Instead, they created bonding between uh, a potential love interest for Kodai. They also give further characterization for uh, this newer character here, which was not in the original show that up until this point in the remake had remained mysterious, and also it created tensions with Yuki and she also has feelings for Kodai. Furthermore, we can look into how these shows handled Kodai and his late brother, as I actually preferred how the remake handled this whole situation over the original. During one of the episodes, Kodai discovers this crashed spaceship, which turns out to be the one that his brother was on. Here, there's this heated, just suspenseful fight that they had on the ship, and Kodai finds his brother's pistol and begins to use it. After this, it becomes this very sentimental object to him because it was the last link with his brother, and there were scenes where he will look at the gun and remember things, or the gun gets referenced by other characters, and it ultimately leads up to this very touching moment at the end of the show. And forgive me for walking on eggshells here, not to spoil you with any of the key details regarding the story's ending, but I felt greater emotional connection to how the issue with Kodai and his brother played out in the remake than I did with the original, and I'm glad uh, that they made a few of these changes. One clear victory on behalf of the remake is actually how they spent more time focusing on the stories of the side characters and it just made for a much more believable and immersive experience when compared to the original because you'll have these characters uh, either the new characters to the story or the ones that uh, carried over from the original show and they have uh, they basically show more of their backstory they show more of their personality and it really makes for a more immersive experience here especially when you have the chameleons and there's actually a bit of conflict within their ranks and they had this within the original show too but they also 
also didn't have the chameleons that would contact Captain Okida and say, you know, I really respect your skills as a warrior. They wouldn't say, oh, we need to work together to achieve this goal because right now we're in a dangerous situation for both of our ships. It really made it feel like uh, there were people on both sides that could go either way, that there were both good and evil on either sides. And I don't know, I just made for a much more enjoyable experience for me. Another clear victory on behalf of the remake is combat. And logically, there's no competition here. The original was from the 1970s and limited by its animation standards of its time. Plus, it was a trendsetter of space-based naval conflict, meaning that there wasn't really any competition for them of that time there. There's also the fact that sci-fi anime from the 1970s had made little effort to create suspension of disbelief there. Space anime back then was more about a magical adventure through this sea of infinite possibilities than it was a dangerous journey through a black abyss. Because of this, there are times that the original anime would feature things like giant flying morphing space monsters or the time that they encountered a minefield so they inflated a scale replica of this balloon that looked like the Amato and they flew that into the mines to uh, detonate them there as if the mines, uh, first of all, would be detonated by a balloon and secondly, uh, would only detonate by something that would look like the Amato. I don't know why they didn't just shoot them, but that's kind of the experience of sci-fi anime uh, back in the early 70s. That's not to say that there aren't any intense battles in the original either though, because there were times that the Yamato would have to take strategic advances in order to barely win. Like there was this one time where the enemy had these energy shields up and the Yamato mostly has energy weapons because it's the spaceship in the future. So all that they did was they just swapped out their weapons for the uh, traditional like physical cannon rounds and they would just use the metal rounds that would just fly right through it. But it was the split second decision that really made some of the battles in the older series exciting, but I felt like they were just pockets of excitement in a show where a lot of the battles I kind of just laughed at them uh, because they would do a lot of uh, funny things in them. I have to admit, I don't know if I was supposed to laugh at this, but you see the people in the bee suits, or you see the, the magical floating rocks, like I said, or the flying space monsters and stuff. It's hard not to laugh at that stuff, and I feel like that kind of took away from the excitement of battle. The remake, on the other hand, benefits from having decades worth of space war anime to learn from, but also realizes that stuff like inflatable balloons just aren't going to work for its target audience anymore. The result is mainly two different types of battles in the newer anime. One where everyone on both sides just goes in with guns blazing and everything gets blown up and two where they have to strategically plan their next move in order to survive. Both were actually a lot of fun to watch here. It also helps to see the damage that the Yamato takes in the new anime as the hull will get ripped wide open by crashing into other ships or just getting hit by so many missiles and lasers at once and it just gets ripped wide open. You see all these parts flying around and they have to just put these emergency shutters down in all of the different uh, hallways so that they don't lose all of their oxygen there. The battles are just so intense with the new anime. One thing that I really loved about the combat in the remake is how the wave cannon received this massive overhaul and making every use of this weapon. They don't use it all the time, but it's one of these weapons. It's like a trump card. It's not perfect. There are drawbacks to it, but just the whole uh, method that they have to go through in order to actually act activate and fire this weapon. Like, they'll have to, uh, turn on this gravity anchor that'll keep them from flying through space, just hurling through it backwards due to the fact that they're releasing an immense amount of force out of the front of the ship. There's also an order of operations that Okita commands people these various tasks in order to even use the weapon, like activating the power source in the engine room or commanding the bridge people to unlock all of the safeties and gather power. And then there's the targeting reticle that emerges from the deck and then Kodai who just fine tunes with the trigger and aims the ship just right. They really do know how to build up the suspense for this moment when they do use this weapon. You've got Okita giving the commands and everybody's putting on their light protective goggles to protect their eyes from the attack that they're about to do. Kodai grabs this controller that looks just like a gun there and then Okita gives the command. Three, two, one... Fire! <laughs> Thank you. 
And the great part about it is, yeah, they do have a really powerful weapon, but it kind of breaks whenever they use it, so they need to repair it because it's just that powerful that the ship cannot maintain its own strength at times. And the reason why they have such a powerful weapon there is because the enemies are just as powerful as they will hurl these massive asteroid-shaped spinning bullets filled with radiation at these planets and just ruin everything on them. It's just insane watching them do this, or they'll have times that their planet is covered with these satellites that have reflective uh, surfaces to them, and they will shoot a laser out of this massive cannon from one side of the planet, and they'll line up all of the satellites so that they can basically strike somebody anywhere on their planet with this massive beam. I think it's safe to say that the major selling point of the original show was the journey, but the major selling point of 2199 is easily the insane combat because it is the star of the show. It is so much fun. Now, without spoiling you, the endings of both anime create a complete experience in terms of its story, but as far as the content itself goes, I felt like it was a bit lacking due to the fact that there are two instances of Deus Ex Machina in play. One, to expedite the events, to wrap up the story within a few episodes, and two, to create a big false suspense uh, for one of its characters. One thing I should probably add to this, because I know the original and the remake, they both have their sequels to them, I have not seen any of the sequels, I don't know if they're any good, but I can tell you from the ending, if you just want to watch that first anime, whether it's the original or whether it's the remake, you will have a complete experience with that, and if you want to continue, you can. Now in terms of its art and animation, again, the remake is the clear winner here. Now everybody knows I love my old anime, but when you have a show that either perfectly replicates or improves upon everything in terms of its visuals, it's not about liking something that's old or new, it's just about appreciation of the quality quality of the artwork that's here. Not only did Yamato 2199 recreate the designs of the characters and environments to be faithful to the original, but they even went a step beyond that and gave the two alien factions a complete overhaul into becoming these sprawling, elegant alien empires, and each of them was different from each other, and each room that we saw, it was just so much detail on them, and it really felt like I'm actually looking at an alien world here because let's face it in older anime there just wasn't enough ideas being thrown around about aliens and what alien civilizations would look like. Also fans of Neon Genesis Evangelion will probably note that Yamato 2199 advanced plug suit technology by at least 50 years. I mean seriously it looks like they take every opportunity possible to put these happy gap asses in front of the camera. Now, in terms of the CG quality here, 2199 manages to knock it out of the park. It's used for the backgrounds, it's used for the ships. I think they did an outstanding job here. And I don't know how there's so many anime that totally butcher the use of CG when we have such an outstanding example of how CG should be used in anime from 2012. I mean, some of the anime nowadays that use CG are animated worse than PS1 RPGs back in the day. I'm looking at you, Berserk. Moving on to the final verdict, I wanted to say that both of these shows were enjoyable to watch for one reason or another, but the clear winner here is Space Battleship Yamato 2199. While I did enjoy the original for its story, and honestly the cheesiness of it, I have to admit I got a good laugh out of a lot of those battles and a lot of the things that were going on there because it was really cheesy to me. For that reason, I am so glad that the creators of the remake had the power to decide what to leave in, what to take out, and what parts they should add of their own here. For this reason, I wanted to say thank you to Yutaka Izubuchi, the director, scriptwriter, storyboard planner, series composition, and mechanical designer. You wore many hats in this series and it paid off. Good work, you created one of the few great examples of an anime remake that not only lives up to the expectations of its original, but exceeds it. I just hope that we see many more classic anime get this level of a loyal treatment in terms of its remake in the future.
Not Berserk though, we're never gonna get a good one of that. Thanks for watching, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with anime news, my anime reviews, discussions, lists, I really do it all here. If you'd like to help support the channel as well, or vote for what I review next, then head on over to the Patreon, because I'm mostly funded by viewers at this point. I'll see you all next week with a discussion of why people are embarrassed to talk about anime, and hopefully a review of the new Castlevania animation. I'll see you guys then.